The Matrix is a system, Neo. That system is our enemy. But when you're inside, you look around. What do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. Until we do, these people are still part of that system. That makes them our enemy. You have to understand, most of these people are not ready to be unplugged. And many of them are so inert, so hopelessly dependent on the system, that they will fight to protect it. Are you listening to me, Leo? Are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? Welcome to Nuance. I am your favorite contrarian, Michael Wood Jr. Well, I actually don't view myself as a contrarian, but I have been called that. I guess that is still fairly tame in this era where critical thinkers are eventually going to be labeled an alt-right Nazi racist. Anyway, you who is listening right now, yes, you, seriously, you are a rare breed. Unless you are one of a handful of hate listeners who just can't get enough of wishing they were more involved in my life, then you are a truly unique individual. You are clearly on a quest to learn and challenge not just your beliefs, but also your way of identifying in life, your own identity. I believe in ending oppression and finding solutions to improve society for everyone. The foremost barrier to discovering purpose and truth is our own biases and ignorances. I have worked endlessly at refining this mindset. It is, it is not a skill. It is a, working to see past yourself is constant work. It is a mindset and one that requires deep humility and an acceptance that nothing is truly known. Knowledge is more like a collection of knowing what is not true. And when something is known, it is, only a t it is only a tentative position until a superior argument is made. Anyway, I have previously read some articles uh, th that were rejected from mainstream publication. I haven't been in a mainstream publication for years. During the violence porn of the Baltimore uprising and Baltimore police corruption, I was constantly turning down offers to write articles. I mean, now that the uh, narrative has shifted now that the the liberal narrative has shifted i guess from fighting oppression to f fighting to be the oppressor the talk of solutions and academic debate has more or less faded from existence i guess the good part is is that we won't have my words butchered by an editor with an agenda and we can do video and podcast presentations without fighting with publishers about what i am going to do with my own damn work so I will do this for all of my non-peer-reviewed articles, and I thank you immensely for being here. Uh, hopefully it helps in some way. And if you want to help, please just share the videos and share the podcast on as many sites as you can, as many services as you can, as many people who are involved in the discussion makes the discussion better. Thanks. Nuance. Noun. A subtle difference in or shade of meaning. Expression. Or sound. Nuance. Noun. A subtle difference Nuance. in or shade of meaning. Noun. Expression. A subtle or difference sound. in or shade of meaning. Noun. Expression. A or subtle sound. difference in or shade of meaning. Noun. Expression. Or sound. Noun. A subtle difference in or shade of meaning. Expression. Or sound. Let's clear the air on the Electoral College, Equity, and Capitalism, the truth behind a narrative of American tribalism. Every so often, the media floods people with tense arguments over the Electoral College, and 2019 is one of those times. 
Two other divisive narratives that circulate around are of the virtues of capitalism and the use of equity. If there was only one lesson to be learned from Russiagate, it was to be wary of media narratives. The discussion around the Electoral College, capitalism, and the concept of equity is another example of media manipulation, with seemingly no other purpose besides keeping the demonization of others as the enemy, these topics are presented as incompatible. However, they are deeply connected and require each other, just as America requires them. The most varied and corrupted of the three topics is equity, making it an excellent place to start. Time spent in the library will give the general idea that equity is the quality of being fair and impartial in a process. Beyond the scholars, equity has become integrated with law to communicate fairness and justice over vengeance and punishment through fixed principles that apply to all. Social media presents many with a biased view of equity as explained by a common meme of three people of various heights attempting to look over a wall. Though this meme is misrepresented as evidence to confirm a preconceived narrative, this meme is a relatable way to understand equity when placed in context. The equity meme. There are various depictions and evolutions of this visual meme. For clarity, Three people stand with their backs to the audience, with a wall in front of them. One person is short, one medium, and one tall. The wall is higher than the medium person, but lower than the tall person. All three are attempting to see over the wall because seeing over the wall represents achievements. Each of these people are assumed to be equal other than their height. As they stand at the wall, we can visualize and meme the concepts of equality of opportunity, equality of outcome, and equity. Equality of Opportunity Equality of opportunity is the sense that all people should have the same chance to see over the wall. In our scenario, when everyone has equal opportunity, the short and medium person will find it very hard, if not impossible, to see. Since the tall person was born of greater height, they can wonder why the short and medium people are complaining about the tall person's successes. Especially when no one is actually stopping them from seeing over the wall, the short and medium people can develop resentment towards the tall despite no acts of oppression being committed by the tall. In humans, inequality is a leading causation for war and violence. When equality of opportunity begins from an unbalanced start, then in practice, inequality of opportunity is assured. Equality of outcomes. Equality of outcomes is the idea that each of those people should be forced to have the same achievements. Our scenario is set up to optimally represent the foolishness of seeking equal outcomes. The only way to achieve identical results is to distribute height evenly by taking from the tall and giving to the short, leaving only medium heights. No one is able to achieve or succeed. There are ways of presenting a utopian view of equality of outcome, but even when things work out, it always carries the danger of chopping everyone down. Equity. Equity provides a solution to the equality conundrum. Equity says that the maximum benefit is found in having the tall see over the wall and achieve. Imagine that on the other side of the wall are the instructions for building boxes for people to stand on. The tall can then see over the wall to make a box so that the medium person can see over the wall. Then, with both the tall and the medium person being able to see over the wall, they can build a double tall box for those short in height. With the medium person standing on a medium box and the short person standing on a tall box, everyone can see over the wall, no one was taken from, and everyone can now contribute to achieving successes. Equity includes the creation of getting everyone over the wall. Those who are achieving are making the boxes of equity, which the short and medium people stand upon. This aligns with a sense of justice rather than power obtainment. Hopefully the superiority of equity is made apparent. The misleading of the well-read and ignorance of the unread have led many to believe that there is some contention over this topic and the most beneficial solutions for society. An American Institution of Equity Equity is found throughout American government in ways which benefit every one of us in some fashion. 
Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for all Americans was the categorical imperative during the formulation of the American government. The fulfillment of the Declaration of Independence is the purpose of the U.S. Constitution and preceding governmental direction. Because of the intentions and experiences of the Founding Fathers, what the Electoral College is and why it was created are intimately tied to social equity. What is the Electoral College? While drafting the United States Constitution, the leaders of the emerging country engaged in an intense internal debate over the formulation of the government structures and organization. With the knowledge that direct democracy fails, a new system was needed to enable a functional democracy. When the smoke cleared, the Constitutional Republic emerged as a representative democracy where the president was elected by way of an electoral college. In the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton outlined the Electoral College. Essentially, subgroups are gathered who vote on a choice where majority rules, and a representative of that subgroup convenes with the representatives of other subgroups and vote on a decision where majority rules, and a representative of that group meets with the other group representatives and vote again where majority rules. Each state is allocated a number of representatives, and those representative slots are filled by the state's democratically elected officials. Those representatives then cast votes for the presidential candidate according to the state guidelines. Currently, there are 538 total members of the Electoral College, and thus the commonly referenced 270 is the vote total required to secure the presidency. The Twelfth Amendment to the Constitution was added to clarify the Electoral College as being a vote for a president and vice president ticket as we currently operate. An additional result of the system is that presidential campaigns and politics are likely to focus on purple states that are believed to be influenceable by making a sufficient case. Depending on which party is advantaged, the narrative of the other is often directed towards complaining of undue attention towards these swing states. Due to the methods used to calculate votes, there is a great disparity in the impact or weight of an individual citizen's vote. For the most part, half of the interested American citizens know that it is unfair for the contemporarily left-leaning Rhode Island, Vermont, District of Columbia, New Hampshire, and Delaware to be greatly overrepresented. Predictably, the other half of the interested American citizens know that it is unfair for the contemporarily right-leaning Alaska, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana to be greatly overrepresented. Meanwhile, the underrepresentation of Florida, California, Michigan, Illinois, Texas, and Ohio voters have both halves objecting. Overall, the perceived problem with the Electoral College is that it does not always represent the will of the voters and is thus illegitimate. To which the reply must be, which voters? The entire history of the nation and people have essentially voted to stand on the Constitution and the protections it provides, including equity. The Constitution and its drafting were very nuanced and considerate in the crafting of the Electoral College as an additional layer of protecting the disadvantaged from the mighty masses. An example of the protections in the Electoral College is the infrequently brought up truth that the Electoral College recognizes the District of Columbia's disenfranchisement in the Senate and House of Representatives and restores their vote in presidential elections. And somewhere between what the Electoral College is and why the Electoral College is resides another manipulated aspect of the Electoral College. The Electoral College is where the three-fifths concept comes in for slaves. Far too many have been taught that the Constitution labeled slaves as three-fifths of a person. The belief that the three-fifths concept extends to rights or race is also inaccurate. In reality, it was only for the votes for the Electoral College where slave states received an additional credit of three citizens for every five slaves. In effect, this gave slave states more voting weight. In effect, this gave slave states more voting weight. And that is a rational comment on the historical aspect of the Electoral College. These critiques contributed to the changes that have been made to improve the American system and why that issue no longer exists. Why the Electoral College? Clarity matters in organizing a stable government. 
One of the reasons the founders agreed upon the Electoral College was that it made more secure and manageable elections, such as recounts being sanctioned off into jurisdictions. Imagine a national recount. It would take longer to reach a consensus than the four years of a presidential term. Additionally, since states define the voting qualifications, national clarification is found in the state voting as a group. To achieve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Electoral College provides a system of equity generation when used in political elections. Seeing over the wall with the electoral system is building boxes to elevate underserved Americans. The rural life that creates and distributes the life bread of our people, food, energy, and water, is underserved in the discussion of policy and politics. Not only are they the short people in our equity meme, but their seeing over the wall is the most important achievement for anyone to see over the wall. The narrative and concerns of the urban peoples will justifiably not understand the impact of some policies on the rural people and themselves. With systems based on equity, the distribution of elevation, the boxes, shifts to the societal issues of the time. It will not always be the urban, suburban, rural paradigm. The importance is in the systems and institutions creating the means to elevate the silence, which the Electoral College does. The Principled American Americans have demonstrated difficulty with extrapolating the micro to the macro. This truth revealed itself in a common argument against the Electoral College, that swing states dominate the discussion. Of course this is true, but in an equitable electoral college, all you need to do is convince your neighbors. Convince enough neighbors and your state becomes a swing state. In a direct democracy, the suburbans and rurals must convince complete strangers thousands of miles away with very little apparent commonalities. In effect, there is no reasonable pathway to making Chicago, Baltimore, Los Angeles and such break out of their limited exposure and have swing potential under a direct democracy where the media and information are dominated by the interests of the urban areas. Of no coincidence, this is precisely the result in the direct democracy of clicks and views in media advertising. The right. If the right were principled, it would see the benefits of applying equitable systems like the Electoral College. The leaning on law and order is essential to a modern first world nation, but the commitment to that societal contract must be as principled as the beliefs of the founding fathers and the great Americans who created what is very likely the greatest nation ever. Equity was argued to be a necessary component of our constitutional republic. Is the American right now turning its back on the constitutional principle when it's convenient? If the vice of manipulation is avoided, all could see that equity in the Electoral College are ways to elevate others while doing no harm to yourself. Even science says this perspective shift can change everything. The Left The overwhelming reason why the Electoral College is being discussed is due to the perception that the outcomes have been harmful to the Left. If the Left were principled, it would have been vocal about the Electoral College when the 44th President of the United States of America enjoyed a 32-vote advantage from the Electoral College against Mitt Romney. Equity has worked for the Left, but it requires something challenging to acknowledge. Capitalism is very much in alignment with equity. Capitalism needs great successes to bring up as many people as possible. Not in the juvenile trickle-down argument but instead that capitalism enables equity. Think about the opportunities created for people by modern internet access. Yes, tall people may get taller, but the tall make the boxes for the short to achieve. There is no equity without the tall. The people are not equal in the objective value of height. The left must recognize that not all people are the same. The dichotomy of the left and right lacks the nuances, but the broad categorizations do frame the environments of most Americans. Despite the influences, all citizens of the Union can step back and rationally approach emotionally intense topics. For example, equity requires recognizing individual merit. The people with individual merit are a necessary prerequisite for equity to be possible. They are the tall. 
Additionally, Americans must ask if the media has earned the public's trust, if the limited perspectives and blinding caused by tribalism are worth it, and if credible principles are being followed. Misapplications Equity is a principle, and the most straightforward test to see if your ideas are principled is if you still believe in them even when they go against your personal benefit. The principle of equity is for the sake of that process, not for a particular outcome outside of what is best for the country. Earlier, it was noted that equity must be based on objective measurements. The left taints equity through their public narrative of ignorance when they apply equity to subjective measures. Equity applied to individual concepts is no more than a tyrannical power grab. Most commonly, this is displayed in the negative results that have occurred when equity is misapplied as a way to rectify past issues, as well as on subjective measurements such as race and ethnicity. Equity is really about balancing current issues and not pushing people over the wall, but enabling achievement. Socially constructed and subjective terms change throughout time and depending on influence. Those with the power of controlling the definitions are unavoidably incentivized to continually redefine the subjective terms until no one deserves advantages except for them. The redefining of subjective terms by the powerful has long been a trick to fool the masses. Before long, it will be believed that rich people with multiple houses, elite educations, and slick-tongued doublespeak, born tall, represent the interests of the short and medium backbone of America. Many on the right have heard the term equity described as being un-American, unconstitutional, anti-capitalism, and a far-left communist ideal, all of which are quite far from the truth. The facts are that the Founding Fathers and the concepts that fueled the understanding of checks and balances in government are equity. The contemporary topic demonstrating this is the Electoral College debate. The Electoral College is equity in governmental action. And the right is, justifiably, proud of it, as all Americans should be. Further discussion. All said, it would require a constitutional amendment or backdoor, such as the still strengthening National Popular Interstate Compact, the MPVIC, to replace the Electoral College. The replacement proposals are thin and mainly center around the purposely avoided direct democracy. A vote from popularity was a great fear of the Founding Fathers, and the nation is already awash in the complications of another. There is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader, and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. John Adams in a letter to Jonathan Jackson. Democracy is not just a logical fallacy, the argument from popularity, it is also a justification for tyranny. There is no exaggeration in the colloquialism that democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on what is for dinner. And if you claim to be a member of the oppressed, you are claiming to be a low power lamb. Of important note, is that a significant component of the Constitution is interstate relations and policy between nations, the maintenance of which is primarily conducted by the President of the United States and the Executive Branch. In the basic design of the Constitution, the President is supposed to be a nationalist who represents the interests of the states, not the people. The argument has been presented that the one person, one vote concept applies to the presidential election. Again, this argument misunderstands the American government. The Constitution is not just for the people. It includes the branches of government and necessary institutions. The people are represented by state representatives and the communities as divided by the organization of the states. Part of the purpose of a state is for subgroups to assemble governments to manage like interest societies within the American compact. The people are casting a vote for their electoral college members to consider. The people already got their one person, one vote when they elected the representative. 
The total popular vote is nothing more than a talking point for media to get your eyes and ears to feel you have somehow been wronged. It is the states who select the representatives on the Electoral College. It must be made very clear that the president oversees the union, not the people. The states within the union have power and measures of sovereignty. The national voter registry that would be required for a federal popular election is the establishment of a whole new set of rules and requirements that break down well-considered protections for America. The immense privilege of being American exists in part because of two important principles. Those two intentions of the U.S. Constitution were to temper populist influence and establish the equitable prioritization of the most important stakeholders. Equity is essential. Yes, campaigns focus on the purple or swing states, but each American freely chooses in life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness whether or not to play an active role in which states are subject to swing. Like most cops, the emotions felt when pinning the badge in my uniform for the first time was a source of immense pride, but also a shocking reality to the complication of performing a duty under the weight of such power and responsibility. The, explosion, as you can see, the callousness of veterans cops and the braggadocious masculinity of the streets are immature expressions of the generations of trauma enacted on our brothers and sisters from a system oppressing us all. My internal fights with policing, whistleblowing, scholarly endeavors, reform efforts, and politics have failed in exhausting fashion. And what I'm trying to say is, is that we are looking at people who are doing nothing new, and if we focus on the actions, then we can fix the things for next time. Because when you focus on people, we end up thinking we can chop the head off, they put a new person in, and something will change. But if we don't focus on the methodologies look, look, and the institutions, then we will be totally missing. Somebody, put them in a, in a prison cell, do the paperwork, go back out, and do it again. So what we really need is to change the incentives and disincentives so that no matter what the role, we're still going towards that objective that actually serves you. More occupation, more vehicles, if your answer continues to be violent, because we have to understand that everything about policing is inherently violent. I have come in there with authority and told you what you will do. I, I believe one of the reasons behind my struggles is that I had not laid out a consistent and intertwined philosophy of what in the hell I was trying to say. For the philosophical foundations of crime and punishment to be ushered into the 21st century, a reimagination of our institutions is necessary. Building off the famous works of Caesar Beccaria, I construct those pathways to the Enlightenment period of justice. Free will, sanctuary cities, gun control, eyewitness testimony, incarceration, and more must all work together for a prosperous society. Learning these lessons has been a brutal journey for me and is unlikely to be an easy one for you, but it is one that we owe to the future, to make a safer world for our children to enjoy life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Crimes and Punishments in the 21st Century by yours truly, Michael Wood, is most conveniently ordered from the evil empire Amazon because we are in that 21st century after all. For the enhanced and expanded audiobook, check out Audible. In the meantime, the philosophical half of Crime and Punishments, all 40-some chapters and then some, is being presented as a free podcast from iMember Media at imembermedia.com and will be available on all major platforms and direct from the publisher. Pause the video or see the links in the notes and prepare for the challenge and adventure of self-critical thought. Rather cloudy in the southeast. Patchy rain will arrive in the north.